Well, so thank, thanks so much, John, for inviting us to present this paper today. And thanks, of course, to the Sloan Foundation for generous uh, support for this paper. But not only that, also the organizing these conferences every year, because um, I believe this paper originally came out of a conversation that Mark and I had um, two years ago during this conference and resulted in a successful grant application and then um, what is now this paper, which is still in very preliminary form. Um, hence the uh, warning right here. So, and this work is joint not only with Mark Duggan, but also with Emily Jackson, who is a PhD student in the economics department here. And Emily and I decided we, um, we decided that Mark was gonna take all the, the hard questions here, so. All right, well, so uh, as, as most of you know, the Affordable Care Act is uh, a big reform that took place in the American healthcare system. It was passed by President Obama on uh, March 23rd, 2010, with many of its main provisions taking effect in January 2014. And one of its primary goals was to increase health insurance coverage. And it did this in a variety of different ways through different provisions, including Medicaid expansions that were meant to cover all people below 138% of the federal poverty line. Um, this ended up occurring in some states, but not in others, as I'll discuss more uh, in a few slides. Um, also with subsidies that were uh, designed to provide incentives for coverage for people between 100 and 400% of the poverty line for um, health insurance purchase through uh, these new health insurance exchanges. An individual mandate that um, uh, imposed a penalty on people who did not have health insurance coverage and incentives for employers to either um, offer coverage or maintain coverage that they already offered. And so what you see in this, this figure is, this just shows the percentage of people who are uninsured between the ages of 18 and 64 uh, over about a six year period from January 2010 to March 2016. And I've drawn a red line, a vertical line, when the ACA took effect and you see pretty um, a clear pattern that the uh, uninsurance rate seemed to go down pretty dramatically uh, right when the ACA was implemented. Um, and while this does show a sizable drop occurring uh, at the same time, uh, the decline you know, could have been a result of other factors such as improvements in the economy that were happening around this time and faster job growth over this period. And it's also masking a lot of heterogeneity. We could have seen some places that had bigger drops and some places that had little uh, smaller drops. And so we'll kind of show you some of that heterogeneity as we go forward and try to understand how much of that decline was actually due to the, um, the Affordable Care Act, or at least certain provisions of the Affordable Care Act. So that's the first research question we're gonna try to um, uh, shed some light on in, in this talk. How much of this reduction in uninsurance seen since 2014 was actually due to the um, Affordable Care Act? Um, and earlier, uh, while the Affordable Care Act was being um, discussed, the Congressional Budget Office came up with some estimates about how this might impact the labor force. And um, their sort of main uh, baseline estimate about what impact this would have um, was uh, that it would reduce the total number of hours worked by about 1.5% to 2% over a long period after the, the full provisions of the law took effect and that this reduction in hours represents a decline in the number of full-time equivalent workers of about two to two and a half million people. So uh, the next question we want to look at is basically how much of, uh, you know, how, how much has labor market outcomes changed um, over this period as a result of the Affordable Care Act? If I show you the aggregated data, and now this is just um, labor force participation rates for those age 16 and over, so it's an even um, wider population than the first graph that I showed you, you don't see uh, a very big, uh, sharp change occurring at the same time that the Affordable Care Act takes effect. But again, this could sort of mask a lot of heterogeneity in what's going on, and so we're gonna kind of take a deeper look at this um, uh, with some, some new data that we'll show you soon. So the second question is just, what is the impact of the Affordable Care Act on labor market outcomes? Okay, so one of the challenges in looking at this reform, which is national and occurred um, at the same time everywhere, is that there's no natural control group. So there's no group, uh, there's no um, set of states that sort of lived in a world where there was no Affordable Care Act that we can easily compare to to understand 
what were the impacts of the Affordable Care Act and not just things that were trending differently over this time period. And so what we're going to do is we're going to um, take an approach that's been used in, in other literature, um, also related to health insurance, and exploit geographic variation in the ex expected treatment intensity across um, these very fine geographic areas, which I'll tell you more about. And um, what we're going to assume is that absent um, the Affordable Care Act, these places with different treatment intensity would have evolved pretty similarly. Um, from the pre-period to the post-period after the ACA. Um, and so I'll, I'll show you some, um, uh, I'll give you more details about what exactly those measures of, of treatment intensity are soon, but it relates to sort of the um, percent of the population who's uninsured and also eligible for either Medicaid expansions or um, subsidies from the Affordable Care Act. Okay, so just to give you a quick preview of the findings, um, we find that the Affordable Care Act had a significant impact on health insurance coverage. This should come as no surprise. It's very similar to um, other work that has also shown substantial impacts of the Affordable Care Act. We estimate for the group that we're gonna focus on, which is the near elderly, 45 to 64 year olds, that the increase was about 2.6 percentage points um, due to the Affordable Care Act, and that's about 80% of the drop in, in insur uninsurance um, that occurred over this time period, so a pretty big share. The other thing we're gonna show you is that this, uh, this decrease happened um, through different provisions of the Affordable Care Act um, in different types of states. So in states that chose to expand Medicaid, uh, the uh, greater share of this reduction was coming from Medicaid expansions, and in states that did not, a greater share of this reduction was coming from um, subsidies. Um, so the increases happen differentially uh, in places where the expected treatment intensity was higher. And this is still very preliminary for reasons that I'll describe more in more detail, but so far we find no evidence that labor market outcomes changed in 2014 as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Okay, So we'll come back to this at the end and talk about reasons why we may expect to see something different in the coming years, um, but that's at least what we have uh, right now. Okay, so there are several uh, provisions of the Affordable Care Act, and I'm only going to focus on a couple of them in this talk today. Um, so the, the ones that we're going to focus on are both the expansions of the Medicaid program to cover individuals under 138% of the poverty line and subsidies towards health insurance coverage um, for people between 100 and 400% of the, of the federal poverty line. So prior to the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid only covered um, certain groups um, and, uh, excuse me, so it was mandated to cover certain eligible eligibility groups, um, but not mandated to cover everyone under a certain income level. The Affordable Care Act uh, changed that and um, provided uh, extra funding to cover these um, newly eligible individuals. However, um, this, the Supreme Court uh, actually uh, decided in 2012 that the ACA's provisions on sort of mandating uh, Medicaid expansions across all states was unconstitutionally coercive. And the remedy that they came up with was th that they would constrain the federal government's power in sort of enforcing state compliance with this provision. So as a result, only 25 states, um, including the District of Columbia, actually expanded their Medicaid programs. And you can see which ones did so in this map. Um, the dark blue states are ones that expanded on January 1st, 2014. An additional seven states have expanded since then. Um, so if we, if we did kind of a similar type of, of figure um, in, uh, in 2015 or 2016, we would have more states with Medicaid expansions. Okay, so let me also describe a little bit how these subsidies work to those of you who may not be familiar. So the subsidies work by basically determining a portion, uh, a maximum portion of your income that you uh, pay towards health insurance premiums. And that portion depends on uh, your income. It's a certain percentage of your income. And what percentage it is precisely depends on where in the income distribution you are. Okay, so if you're at um, uh, about 100% of the federal poverty line, then your contribution towards health insurance premiums is 2% of your income. 
Anything above that is, um, would then be provided to you in the form of a subsidy based on a certain uh, type of insurance plan that's available in your area. And this percentage of income that you are expected to pay increases to 9.5% uh, nine um, by the time you get to 300% of the poverty line. And so your subsidy correspondingly gets, gets smaller. Once you cross over 400% of the federal poverty line, you're not eligible for a subsidy anymore. And so you can see in this figure that shows you the amount of a subsidy for just kind of someone um, in the, uh, facing a US average premium that the subsidy goes down to zero with a cliff um, at 400%. It also um, is not available to you if your income is less than 100% of the federal poverty line. So you can see a steep um, increase right when you hit 100% of the federal poverty line. So importantly, the subsidy you know, varies by income, but it doesn't vary based on other characteristics. So um, if you look at this, how the subsidy might look for people of different ages, because the premiums that older individuals face are higher, um, the implied subsidy is also higher. For younger individuals, the subsidy is much lower. Okay? Um, the, the other thing that these, the subsidies don't take into account is the fact that premiums vary a lot across different areas. So if you live in a high cost county like Pitkin County in Colorado, um, your implied subsidy is much higher because the, the, the premium that your subsidy is tied to is a higher premium, whereas if you live in Minnesota, your subsidy is lower. Okay, so there's geographic variation both in the Medicaid program and whether the program expanded or not, and also the subsidy levels that are available across people. So the other thing that varies across different regions is just what percent of the population was uninsured prior to the ACA. And so we're gonna exploit some of that also in our analysis. So if you look at this um, slide, what you see is the percent uninsured in different states in 2013 and also in 2015. And then there's a column where, which indicates whether uh, the state expanded their Medicaid program or not. And so let me just focus on uh, a few different states. First, let's take three states that expanded their Medicaid program. California, Massachusetts, and New York all expanded their programs. Um, you can see that California started off with a very high percent of their population uninsured, 21.6%. Um, this reduced quite a bit to 11.8% in 2015 following the Affordable Care Act. In Massachusetts, there was a very small percentage of people uninsured before the Affordable Care Act. Um, uh, likely because they uh, passed their own health reform um, prior to the Affordable Care Act. And so you see a very small reduction in the percentage um, who are uninsured from 2013 to 2015. New York is somewhere in the middle. And if I then look at three states that did not expand their Medicaid program, again, you see pretty different differences in, pretty big differences in baseline levels of uninsurance across states. So Virginia, for instance, only had 13.3% of their population uninsured, while Texas had 27%. And correspondingly, different levels of changes, different changes um, from 2013 to 2015. Um, uh, Virginia had a very small change, and Texas had a, had a larger change. OK, so how could the ACA affect the labor market? The CBO basically cited four different provisions that um, they thought were going to account for the bulk of the response in the labor market outcomes. The first is the subsidies for health insurance purchased through the exchanges. These subsidies are only available if you purchase insurance through the exchanges and not available if you get insurance from your employer. Um, the second is the expansion of Medicaid eligibility. And the third and fourth are things that we're not focusing on this paper, but are equally important. Uh, penalties on employers that decline to offer insurance and new taxes that are imposed on labor income. There's also other ways that the ACA could affect um, uh, the labor market from the demand side. So for instance, there are provisions that waive penalties for firms that don't offer health insurance, um, who have less than 50 employees that could lead employers to have incentives to change the number of workers that they have um, employed at their firm. Um, there are also provisions that waive penalties for firms who do not offer insurance to employees working less than 30 hours. 
And um, so we're, we're not going to basically be able to disentangle all of these different things, but we're going to show you effects on labor market outcomes, not just labor supply or labor demand. There are also reasons to believe that the ACA could particularly affect older workers. As I showed you earlier, the effect of subsidies are highest for the near elderly workers because they face the highest um, premiums. There are also rating regulations that limit the ability of insurers to vary premiums by age, introducing another sort of implicit subsidy present in the ACA. And there's also evidence um, in, uh, in a lot of prior work that labor supply elasticities are higher for individuals nearing retirement, which could be, make this age group in particular just a good age group to, um, to look at. Okay, so let me be more clear about what we're actually doing. Um, so our empirical approach is going to um, exploit geographic variation and the expected intensity of treatment by the Affordable Care Act. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take baseline levels of the share of the region that's uninsured and under 138% of the federal poverty line and also measure the share of the region uninsured and between 139 and 399% of the federal poverty line, and we're also gonna record Medicaid expansion status. Um, our, our hypotheses are that in expansion states, Medicaid and private coverage would increase. In non-expansion states, Medicaid may, may, may not change much, but private coverage may make up some of the difference and increase more. Um, and we're also, uh, in, we're, we're hypothesizing that places with a larger share of the population eligible for one or two of these provisions would have bigger changes in, in overall health insurance coverage, and we can also look at it um, by source. And then the, the next phase is to look at labor, labor market outcomes, and our hypothesis here is just that places with bigger changes in insurance coverage would also have um, bigger changes in labor market outcomes if it, it is, in fact, the Affordable Care Act that is um, causing those changes. Okay, so we're basically going, going to estimate the following regression where we have a left-hand side variable that measures um, insurance coverage, um, either overall health insurance coverage or by source. Um, and we, on our right-hand side variable, we have um, a post dummy, which right now is basically the same as a 2014 dummy because we're only using one year of post data. Um, we're going to interact this, this um, post dummy with our, um, our measures of expected treatment intensity. We're also going to control for demographics, age fixed effects, and, and importantly, we're, we're going to include um, these region and year fixed effects. And the region effects, uh, region fixed effects will basically control for any fixed differences across these different places. And, and therefore, um, we, don't, uh, we can't control separately for the intensity variable itself. I mean, it, it's, it's the same as this um, region fixed effect. Okay, so we're, um, we're also interested in how this effect may vary across expansion states relative to non-expansion states. And, and so we'll interact the, the post dummy and the interaction term um, with expansion status um, to examine that. And then we'll run similar specifications with labor market outcomes on the left-hand side. Okay, so I think I kind of covered the identifying assumptions before, but um, basically we're assuming that um, without the Affordable Care Act, places with a low treatment intensity relative to a high treatment intensity would evolve similarly after we control for the fixed differences across those two groups. And places with a given share of uninsured individuals who are under 400% of the poverty line in expansion states and non-expansion states um, in the absence of the Affordable Care Act would again um, look similar. Okay, so um, the data that we use is the American Community Survey. Um, we're, this is a large household survey with about three and a half million annual subjects and a high response rate, so that makes it a good candidate for this analysis. Um, some of the downsides of this data set is that um, the 2015 data are not yet available, so we're only using data from 2014 and what I'm showing you now, which is why I want to caution the preliminary aspect of this paper. Um, however, the 2015 data does come out October 20th, and Emily is, you know, refreshing, 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 um, uh, waiting for that to come out. We're going to focus on the civilian population ages 45 to 64 and what I'm showing you today. 
And this um, gives us about four and a half million person year observations. So um, let me spend a little bit of time telling you about the geographic identifiers that are in the uh, ACS, because I think this will share a lot of the sort of the richness and the variation that we're going to exploit. So um, what we're using is um, a public use microdata areas, which are referred to as PUMAs. PUMAs do not cross state borders, um, and they're, uh, the size depends a lot on the population density because they, they are sort of um, structured so that they have a minimum population of about 100,000 individuals. And they're redefined every decennial census, which leads to some complications um, from an empirical standpoint because we have to sort of um, come up with a consistent set of PUMAs over our sample period. Um, we use a, a simulation methodology, which I won't go to in detail now, but I can answer more questions about um, during the Q&A. So if I look at the percent, less than 138% of the federal poverty line who are also uninsured in 2013 for ages 45 to 64, um, and plot them with darker regions for places with a higher measure and lighter um, for regions with a lower measure. You can see that there's quite a lot of uh, variability um, across the country in this measure. So it ranges from 0% to 37 percentage points um, across uh, the US. And the average number is about 6 percentage points. Um, some of the lowest uh, areas, the areas with, um, with 0 are in Massachusetts, um, but the highest Values, um, interestingly, for this measure are near McAllen, Texas, which has been in a lot of um, media reports about having very high um, health care costs. Okay, so I just want to um, emphasize the fineness of these geographic areas because I think it, it, it's really important. So um, what, you, what you can't see in this map is um, what happens at those large urban centers. Right here, they just kind of look like um, black. Um, but if I just zoom in on LA County, um, you can see that just one county has 69 Pumas, and there's a lot of variability even within that um, one county that we're able to exploit. Okay, so this is the corresponding, the, a similar map, but for our other measure, 139 to 399% of the federal poverty line. And um, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to focus too much on that, but you can see, again, there's a lot of variability. So the ACS measures health insurance coming from different sources. It's all self-reported, and you can indicate more than one um, source when you respond to the survey. And so uh, you can see that the group we're focusing on is this 45 to 64-year-old group. Um, this is uh, a group where there's uh, reasonably high levels of uninsurance prior to the uh, Affordable Care Act. So this isn't from 2010. Um, and, you know, you wouldn't want to look at the age 65 population here because um, they're primarily covered by Medicare and the ACA didn't do a lot to change that. Okay, okay so the labor market outcomes we look at, um, and I'll show you a little bit of evidence on this, at least the preliminary evidence that we have, are not in the labor force, um, whether you were employed last week, um, self-employment, number of hours, and whether you're part-time or not. Okay. So uh, what I'm first going to do is show you just one table, and then I'm going to move to a figure that illustrates some of these results, and then I'm going to show you the rest of the results just in figures. So what this table basically shows you is three columns where health insurance coverage is the left-hand side variable. The first column, the first specification, is just a post dummy. So this is just kind of the, the naive estimate of what change in insurance coverage happened over this time period between um, the post and the pre after controlling for some demographics. And that's 3.2 percentage points. Um, the second column then adds in these two measures of expected treatment intensity. And um, I'll talk about the magnitudes a lot more in a second, but you can see that both of them seem to matter in the sense that places with a higher share of the population that would be eligible for either Medicaid expansions or subsidies seem to have higher changes, bigger changes, larger changes in health insurance coverage. The third column then splits up that, um, that, that result um, by expansion and non-expansion states. And here you can start to see how the, the uh, insurance coverage is changing, uh, the, the, 
uh, differently in these two different types of states, in particular in non-expansion states, so the top panel, um, you can see that there's no effect of um, whether your region has a bigger share of your population under 138% of the poverty line, but a big impact um, depending on the share of the population between 139 and 399. And if then if you look at separately at um, the expansion states, or this is basically um, the additional effect that you have if you're in an expansion state, you can see that um, the share under 138% matters um, quite a lot there, and there's, there seems to be some added effect also in the 139 to 399 group. Okay, so now let me translate that into these figures and, and just tell you what it is that we're looking at and help us interpret the magnitudes a little bit. So um, what you see here is basically um, yeah, on the x-axis, the share of the population that's less than 138% of the federal poverty line and uninsured in 2013. And then what you see on the y-axis is the change in overall health insurance coverage for 45 to 64 year olds. So 2014 minus sort of an average of 2010, 11, and 10, 11, 12, and 13. And so you can see here, this is basically showing, showing you that slope which is regions with a higher per, uh, share of their population eligible um, for Medicaid, potential Medicaid expansions, um, to have bigger changes in overall health insurance coverage. Um, and this, this uh, seems much more stark in expansion states where we see a significant slope of 0.27 uh, relative to non-expansion states where the slope is 0.05 and not statistically significant. So again, how do we interpret those magnitudes? Well, one thing you can do is think about projecting that red line um, and, and seeing, so what you would imagine at zero happening, maybe you could interpret that as the effect of just overall changes in, in um, the economy, but anything happening um, above that sort of represents something that was due to the ACA expansions. And so if you kind of do that calculation and figure out you know, how much of um, the increase that we saw in insurance coverage over this period was due to this provision, um, the, the overall sort of the area under the triangle um, is, is larger and significant if the slope is steeper, okay? Um, the next figure shows you the same setup, but now with percent 139 to 399% on the x-axis. And um, so if I take both of these together and sort of weight everything by population, then I get that about 80% overall of the increase in health insurance coverage over this time period was due to the Affordable Care Act. That percentage is um, slightly different if you look at expansion states versus non-expansion states. So about 71% in non-expansion states and 86% in expansion states. And the source of that coverage, um, which I'm getting to now, even though I'm already over time, um, is, is different in expansion versus non-expansion. So this is Medicaid coverage. You see um, a significant slope, interestingly, not only in expansion states, but also in um, non-expansion states um, for uh, the percent under 138% of the federal poverty line and uninsured. Um, you don't see a lot of an effect of non-expansion states um, in this, uh, in the share of 139 to 399. Um, this one is still, a, this one is a bit puzzling actually, so you wouldn't necessarily expect higher rates of Medicaid coverage um, with this um, measure, um, but they are somewhat correlated, so it could be sort of picking some of that up. If we look at private purchase coverage, so this is our best guess as to what people are answering when they have um, coverage from the exchanges. Um, you see that in, uh, there's no relationship between the share of the population under 138% of the federal poverty line and uninsured prior to the ACA and um, any changes in private purchase coverage. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the other measure, um, you see kind of a, a upward sloping um, relationship. Okay, so now I'm going to get to the labor market measures. Um, so what you would expect to see here is that not in the labor force, which is our dependent variable, so these, these figures have the same setup as the ones I showed you before, 
Um, but we would expect to see higher rates of people not in the labor force if the CBO report was correct um, uh, on these dimensions that lead to higher, um, higher rates of changes in uh, health insurance coverage. Um, you know, none of these are significant. That's why I haven't put any estimates here or slopes. And you can see there's a lot of noise. Um, but some of, some of this suggests that maybe things are, are, are in the direction that you might expect, even though we don't yet see it in the 2014 data. So it's the same basic story if I look at different measures like employed, um, part-time, self-employed, it's kind of hard to make out what's going on there, um, and the hours um, variable that you see here. Um, so uh, one reason why we might not see much of a change here is because our data spans 2014. We can't actually check. We don't have any information precisely when in 2014 they were interviewed. So on average, if you think they were all interviewed sometime in the summer, you can see that a lot of this drop in insurance coverage hasn't really happened yet. Um, and so the labor market outcomes may even lag it a little bit more. And so we're, we're, we're excited um, that the 2015 data is coming out soon so that we can sort of incorporate um, more, more time into the analysis. So that's kind of where we are now. I won't spend any, any more time um, telling you about the findings, um, and we're excited to hear from Coastly about um, what this all means. So thanks.